Good afternoon and welcome to another episode of Condo Insider. Uh, my name is Jane Sugimura and I'm going to be your host today. And uh, I'm, we're continuing along with our series on the tw uh, 2022 elections because I think it's really important uh, for uh, the listeners and the viewers uh, to get to know the candidates who affect their uh, everything in their daily lives. And I'm, I'm so pleased to have with me today as my guest, uh, Speaker Scott Psyche. Hi, Scott. Thank you for being my guest today. Hi, Jane. Thanks for inviting me today. Yeah, you know, I think it's just really important. And I, I and you know, we the uh, there are so many issues that affect people who live in condominiums. And you know, I get people who call me and they grumble and they say, "Well, what can I do?" I say, "Well, you got to call your legislator or your council member." I mean, that's that's who you got to do. And they got people in their office that do nothing but handle constituent concerns. And you know, a lot of people don't even know who their elected officials are. So, you know, I'm I'm standing on my soapbox and saying, you know, as a concerned citizen and somebody who cares about what happens to themselves, you got to you know get to be best friends with your elected officials. So that's why you know I'm 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 having you know people who you know candidates who are running for office uh, on on my show you know for a series of uh, condo insider shows and you know so that people can get to know you. You know, because that's, I, yeah. you know, I, I think it's important uh, rather than sit back and grumble. I mean, they have to, you know, become, you know, uh, uh, interested in who their elected officials are, find out what they stand for, find out who's going to support them and, and actually go out and vote for them, you know. And that's so I think of, it's yeah. really, really important rather than sitting back and letting things happen to you and then, you know, grumble about that. And then then it's kind of too late. So anyway. Yeah. Tell so us kind of, about your background. I was going to say it's kind of funny that you refer people to me because when I receive complaints, I always tell them, call Jane Sugimura. She knows <laughs> everything about condos. <laughs> See, that's why it's good that, you know, we interact, you know, because now, you know, you know, I know, you know, to send them to me and I know I can send them to you if they got, they want to grumble about something that, you know, got passed. So tell yeah. us about your background. So I, uh, I was actually born uh, and raised on the Kailua side and um, then went to uh, the UH and I got my bachelor's degree and my law degree there. And um, so I do practice a little bit of law on the side, but um, I've been um, a house member since 1994 and I've been the speaker since 2017. And, you know, to, to, to let the, uh, the viewers out there know, you were for a good part of your career in the legislature. You were a dissident. Yes. Right? So even though even though I've been here a while, half of my time in the House was as spent as a dissident member of the House Democratic Caucus. So that was actually a great experience because it teaches you a lot about the process and you know why you're here and what you what you want to accomplish if you have the opportunity. So it's actually a great experience. Okay, and you know, your district that you're uh, running, I mean, why don't you tell us why you're running for a re-election this year? What, yes. what, what are some of the reasons? So my district currently um, uh, includes uh, the Kakako area, uh, Macaulay and the parts of downtown. Uh, but with the redistricting, the new district has removed the Macaulay section. So what's left now is all of Kakako, uh, the Sheridan Pabaa area and a portion of downtown, kind of closer to Pali Highway. Um, so it's a very condensed district. It's basically a high rise and walk up district. Um, but it's just very dense because this is where the population growth occurred on Oahu over the past 10 years. It's basically Kaka'ako and then also on the leeward side. Um, but you know what? I, you know, it's just been great representing this area. Um, and you know, over the years, I've gotten to know a lot of people here, and I've been able to work with a lot of residents. And what I found that even, you know, even in a high-rise district, uh, people are very concerned about the day-to-day -day issues that affect them and their families. And so we've been able, you know, I've, I've had the opportunity to work with residents on all kinds of issues here. Um, you know, repairing sidewalks, repairing roads, building a new crosswalk funding a new dog park. Um, you know, we've just done a lot of projects with the, with the residents here because the bottom line for them is that they want 
a community that is safe and affordable and um, that, that provides them with opportunities. And uh, you mentioned you have a, you, you have so many condos uh, in your district. And, you know, so, so, you know, and, and I want to point out to our listeners that, you know, the many years that I've known you, you've been, you know, friendly to us and we haven't always agreed on issues, but, you know, you've been very supportive uh, of, of the condo issues. And I want to t tell you how grateful we are to have a friend in the legislature like you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we really enjoy working with you, Jane. I think that, um, you know, it's great because you're, you know, you're just, you're in tune with, with the concerns you you understand the law, you understand the practicalities, and you also understand that sometimes, especially with these condo issues, they're very complex. And sometimes they take some time to resolve, but everybody is working together to do that. So that's just, this is great. And, you know, we had some bills that, you know, went through the legislature this year and, um, you know, that, you know, did affect condos. And if you don't mind, you know, I'd like to go through maybe, you know, two or three of them. Uh, one of them was this emotional support animal that was Senate Bill 2002. And that did pass out and the governor did sign it. And so, and you know, th this is something that, um, and and it's 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 very emotional because, you know, it, 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 it involves people with their animals. And, you know, a lot, some buildings are no pet buildings because they pass bylaw amendments where the pets are not allowed. Right, and in fact, right. my building is one of them. We have a no pets amendment. And so I'm always come, you know, having to deal with owners who are saying, how come we got all these dogs in the building? We're supposed to be a no pets building. And, you know, we have to kind of explain to them, well, it's a disability issue and they, they don't understand. You know, they don't understand right. about reasonable accommodations and, 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 and we have a state and a federal law. And uh, so, you know, if you want to, if you can tell us about uh, Senate Bill 2002. Sure. So that, uh, that law was approved. We did approve that in the le last legislative session. The governor signed it into law as Act 154. And it basically uh, is a bill that provides that it is a discriminatory practice uh, to exclude um, someone's um, assist, you know, uh, uh, assistance, uh, assisted animals. So um, you know, it's, this bill was done in recognition of people who do need the support services um, from their pets. And I think it's particularly relevant to a, this condo district where, you know, I, I think there's probably 25% of the units in this district have probably have, have a, piss of a pet, whether it's a dog or a cat or something else. And there's a lot of dogs in this area. And I think people rely on, rely on their dogs for, for support. So I think this is a great bill and it's kind of about time that we approved that. And, you know, we didn't have any legislation on it, but you were involved in the medical marijuana uh, bill a couple of years ago. And that's also in that same area of discrimination and making reasonable accommodations. And, and, and so do you want to talk about that as well? Sure, that's another bill that we approved. You know, the medical marijuana law was approved by the legislature in, I think it was the year 2000, it was in the early 2000s. And it wasn't until a few years ago that we uh, uh, approved another set of legislation that allowed for the implementation of the medical marijuana program or the medical cannabis program in Hawaii. And one of the things that we did have to address was the, was the uh, a law that would require uh, condos to provide accommodation for residents who do have prescriptions and do need to use medical cannabis. Um, we were running into situations where, um, you know, condo residents were not being allowed to use that those prescriptions. So we had to make it clear in the law that there has to be an attempt to accommodate these residents. Okay, well, and you know, it, it has worked out, you know, uh, uh, pretty well, uh, you know, uh, for the, it's just a matter of kind of explaining to the to the residents that, that these are bills that relate to disability. I mean, it's not that, you know, we're pro smoking or, you know, pro pets. It's, you know, these issues all re resolve around, revolve around, uh, you know, disabilities and having to make reasonable accommodations uh, to people uh, with certain disabilities to allow them to, you know, have the assistance animals and the medical marijuana. 
Absolutely. It's basically, yeah. there's basically a medical, a medical purpose uh, in, for both of those areas. And this is to uh, allow them uh, to enjoy, you know, so that they can, you know, enjoy, you know, uh, have uh, peaceful enjoyment of the premises, you know, uh, where they live. Uh, if, in, in the event that, they, you know, they, they you know, there's uh, no pets uh, provision and, you know, uh, smoking provisions. I want to talk about another bill and, and, and you know, uh, we had, you know, support from many House members on this. It was Senate Bill 2196, which was, was deferred. This was the electronic, the uh, electronic vehicle um, charging station bill. And I think the intent was good. And you know, this is the kind of situation where I know that the state has got a policy to reduce the use of uh, uh, fossil fuel energy and, and, and to reduce, uh, to promote the, the sale of electric cars, you know, so that, you know, it would reduce what the carbon footprint, is that what the word is, the, technology, the terminology is, right? Yes. Yeah. And there's a policy, there's a state policy. We understand that. But then I think this bill represents, uh, uh, you know, a misunderstanding of how condominiums work. Because the first bill that came out was that we were, that it was supposed to require condominiums to come up with a plan to put charging stations at every stall in the parking stall, I mean, in the parking garage. And it was like, why would we do that? We don't, not everybody has an electric vehicle and the parking garage is a common element. And why would you make the owners who don't have an electric vehicle pay for charging stations that nobody's going to use? You know, and I, I think I think it was well intended, you know, because it, it, the purpose I think was to make people think about, well, what are we going to do when we have all these electric vehicles and we have condominiums that don't have charging stations? But, you know, when when and they first when we first started this dialogue, you know, the we the, the statute changed about you know when they uh when when they allowed uh electric vehicles you know in, in condos. I mean there was a, a a and I can I think it's uh uh HRS 196 or 197. It says that you know you that the condominium association cannot prohibit an electric charging station being installed in a parking stall. But if that, if the owner of the vehicle wants to install the charger, they got to pay for it. Right. The association doesn't have to pay for it. And that's right. fair. And the problem, and, and, and what, what, what people who don't live in condos don't understand that it's expensive. Because when they built the garage, the, the electric cables that they put into the garage are only for certain purposes to, you know, handle the lights and right. maybe the, the electric gates. There's not enough electricity going into the building to, to what do you call it, to uh, service an electric charging vehicle, electric charger on every stall when you got like 300 stalls, right? In a parking right. garage. Right. And, and so the, the cost of retrofitting that is huge. And, and when, you, when you don't have 100% of the owners or the residents who have electric vehicles, why would you do that? Why would you even plan on doing that? And then, but that, but this, what this bill opened up was a whole dialogue saying, okay, but you know, you, you condos, you got to figure out what to do with the people who have electric vehicles. And so we said, okay, why don't we put, you know, and somebody was saying, well, we could put, you know, make, make people put it in their guest parking, but you know, guest parking is usually on the outside of the building. And so what's to stop somebody from across the street to come over to your building and park in the charger, right? That the association has paid for to charge their electric vehicle. Because you know, there's no way you can deny access. So how do you deny access? Where do you, well, how do you put a, 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 an electric vehicle charging thing you know, on association property and still limit it so that only the residents of the building can use it, right? You don't want... Yeah. The guys across the street coming come, come, coming over and using it. And so it opened up a, a whole big dialogue. But with, you know that the bill that was introduced didn't work. And then when it got amended, I think the amendment said that as of January 1, 2023, no building permits were going to be issued unless you 
you had charging, you know, charging stations in all the parking. And, and that didn't even make sense either because why put charging stations in a parking stall when you don't have 100% of the residents having electric vehicles, right? And, and yeah. when you look at the technology, I mean, HECO has got the your chargers, one, one charging machine that can do multiple vehicles. And who knows, by 2040, we might even have be able to do it remotely, right? Instead of having a, a and you know, so so the technology is evolving, and you know, so uh, I mean, there's a lot of discussion. I think I think what it what what this bill did was it kind of op I mean opened up the discussion, and we started talking about okay, how do we do it? Because you know, a lot of us really, you know, honestly, I know I never thought about it. You know, never thought about well, what how how are we going to accommodate these people? you know, who want to do it. Because right now we've been saying, if you want to put a charging station in your stall, fine, go ahead, do it. You pay for it, right? Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. but, you know, this bill did generate a lot of discussion. And I, I and, and even amongst ourselves, you know, it, it raised a whole lot of issues, which I, I never even thought about, uh, you know, because, you know, it, it, it didn't, you know, um, we didn't have to think about it. But you know, I have to say that you know we were uh, very grateful to the House members, you know, who supported us, you know, in 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 defeating this bill because you know it just wasn't workable, and so I I do want to thank your colleagues for for helping us with that. Yes, you're right. I think this generated like really good, um, you no know, so no pun intended, but it generated a lot of a lot of discussion on this this issue that's really important. I think as you. You know, as you mentioned, the state we did approve a law in the year 2014 that requires a hundred a 100 percent renewable mandate for the state of Hawaii by the year 2045. So we're looking at every opportunity to meet that requirement by the year 2045. And I think vehicles is, you know, the vehicle electric vehicles plays a big role uh, in meeting that goal. And I think for you know, for for those who live in condos, I mean, there's just there's so many dynamics about it because some people live in older buildings that never contemplated EVs, right? Some people live in newer buildings where no EV stations were built, and that's why the bill this bill was amended to require that new buildings provide you know EV charging stations. But I think there has to be yeah, there has to be we have to really brainstorm this because this I think it's going to require a combination of not just some kind of accommodation within high rises, but also outside of high rises, you know, there should be more charging stations made available to the general public at at other at other venues. Um, you know, the example that I always give is Kiko on Ward Avenue, which is in part of my district. They have two two stations um, in their parking lot that are that's available to the public. And I don't understand why HECO can't provide more charging stations, you know, yeah. at a place like Ward Avenue. There should be more, there should be more charging stations because a lot of the time when you drive by, both of the both of the stations are being used and it's very popular. So we have to find all kinds of ways to allow people to charge their vehicles. Because I don't think, I think if you had an adequate supply of stations outside of condos, condo owners would go to those those stations and, and right. charge your cars there if they're convenient, you know, accessible. Um, so we have to, we have to take a macro approach to this issue. Yeah, right. And we and, cannot. You know, just, yeah. And and so you know, and, and I'm I'm kind of leaning towards the thing about if we could you know secure an area on the condo property in, in the common areas where outsiders cannot get in. Maybe right. you know you you put it you know you 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 put in gates and give fobs to residents to get in because you have outdoor guest parking and so they only they, they can have access and then right. put charging stations yeah. there and maybe let people use a charge card right. right and you know this um i mean with uh the advent of technology i mean these kinds of stations are gonna are gonna develop over time and i think they'll be they'll have those kind of security you know uh component safeguards built into them so that you can limit access as well so i, I think you have to watch the technology as well for the charge. Right, because right now the technology, they have technology where you can do a full charge uh, in, in 30 minutes. Right. 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 So, you know, so you can get a bunch of them 
and, and, and set them up in a secure area where only residents can go to it. I think that's a better idea than trying to say, you got to put a charging station in every parking stall in the garage. I mean, to me, that makes absolutely no sense. Right. Whether it's a brand new building or an existing building, the cost involved with that is just, you know, is, is just humongous. Yeah. And it's, you can and also, it's not cost efficient. And I think with some cars, you can also um, use, a, you have to adopt it, but you can use like a regular, electrical cord that you plug it into an outlet in the wall. But as you know, condos don't have outlets right. in the common areas, right? For the most part. So yeah. that's, you know, that makes it challenging. Yeah. Well, why don't we go on to another bill? There's House Bill 2272. And that was what we call the omnibus bill. And Aaron Johansson, Aaron Johansson did an outstanding job. I mean, he had, he had the stakeholders. We had Zoom meetings you know, before the hearings. And he asked some really, really good questions. And then he beat us up on some other issues. But, you know, Aaron was just fully involved with us. And, and that's why we had this one bill. Instead yes. of having all these separate bills, we figured, okay, if you can put it all in one bill, we'll call it the omnibus, omnibus bill. And it, and it kind of did some cleanup on uh, issues. Like, like, you know, with the condo collapse that happened in Florida, we had some people who wanted to, to to beef up our reserves, and Hawaii has got one of the best reserves law, you know, reserve study laws in the country. And you know, and, and the, where the condominium collapsed in Florida, it wasn't mandatory. In Hawaii, it's mandatory. It, uh, uh, condominiums are required to do reserves, have reserve studies, set aside money, and, and you know, it, it is it is mandatory. And we beefed it up this time by, you know, expanding the items who are, that are included in the reserve studies instead of t uh, 20 years, it's 30 years, because that way you catch pipes, which was right. a big, you know, right. controversy in the last 10 years that, you know, some buildings have to replace their pipes right. and there was no money in the reserves. And, and, and then people started beating up on their boards. Like, how come you guys didn't know? And how come you didn't set aside money? Is it because no. pipes are supposed to last 75 years? Who right. knew that they would fail in 40 years, right? I, and wasn't it Macy Hirono who, who, uh, who- Macy, it was the Macy Hirono chart. who started, who, and she beat us up back in the early 90s. And it was, it was she was because she was getting calls from con constituents who bought into a condo and then they hit, get hit with a special assessment for a new roof. And it's like, I just bought into this condominium. How come I got to pay $10,000? And Maisie said, it, and then finally, you know, after I think three years, she, and she would tell me, I want you to tell your people. I, I said, Maisie, you know, they don't listen to me all the time. She says, I want you to tell your people that this has got to be mandatory. It can't be voluntary. Some buildings did it, some buildings did not. She says, if you guys don't get your act together, I'm going to make it mandatory. And to her word, she did. She made it, and it is mandatory. But what we didn't have is we didn't have time limits as to how often you should do a reserve study. See, so some buildings would do it, and they would not do another one for maybe five, 10 years. And you know, these things, the reserve study is a tool that is used by the board to determine when repairs should be done. And it's right. also a tool to kind of keep the board in, in, in sync with, okay, these are the things that have to be done, right? And so it comes up every year. Uh, the reserve study says, okay, this year you're gonna replace this, this, and this according you know, to, to the uh, expiration of the useful life. And we have money set aside so you don't have to do a special assessment. That was a whole purpose for the, for the reserve study. And you know, when it was first implemented, the DCCA, they, they hired the UH, who, they came up with a manual, they went, uh, I, they went to the neighbor islands, they had seminars. I mean, they went all out to teach people how to do a reserve study, how to do, a, you know, set up a budget, to incorporate the reserve study. I mean, it was really uh, a, an all out effort and it and they repeatedly did it. And, you know, and, and CAI and Hawaii Council and the Real Estate Commission, uh, the, you know, we, we every year about budget season, we always have seminars about budget and reserves. And, you know, to, to, yeah. to, so to educate board members as to the importance, but uh, with, uh, House Bill uh, 2272, we did beef, beef, you know, we expanded the uh, cash flow plan to include items, uh, you know, from 20 to 30 years. 
we did set a schedule that you have to have your reserve study updated at least every three years. And, and this is an ongoing controversy, so we're going to have to come back next year. It, we, we, we couldn't decide on, on the language as to what the specialist is called who does the reserve study. CAI, which is Community uh, Associations Institute, has a certification for something called a reserve specialist. Okay, but that's only a certification that CAI has. And so, you know, uh, uh, typically, you know, uh, uh, an architect can do a reserve study, engineers can do reserve studies, and because all it does is you have to look at, they have to go to the building, they have to pick out the components that would go into a reserve study. In other words, things that have, have to be repaired over, you know, a one year cycle, and then they would determine the useful life and the cost of, you know, those repairs. And uh, so, um, uh, you know, we, we really didn't, you know, we really haven't nailed down who is, who can do the reserve study. And, and, and that's where the dispute was this session and we didn't get it resolved. So I'm pretty sure we're gonna come back next session to, because that's what I, because I, I, you know, my, 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 my suggestion to the uh, proponents is we gotta get this bill out with what we've got. And if we, if the only issue is who, who is going to be doing the reserve study, I mean, we can come back. We can come back and deal with that right. next year. Right. Right. But, you know, we, we did get that done. And so we're very grateful to Aaron for his leadership on that. And, um, and uh, we, the, we did uh, say that, you know, with the developer's public report, it has to include the breakdown of the annual maintenance fees. And it has to include the annual contribution of the reserve based on the reserve study. And that's something that was never done, you know, so that when somebody buys into a brand new condo, they have this information, you know. Right. So it's not a big surprise 10 years down the road when, you know, when, when you know, they have to, you know, uh, do the first thing. And, and one of the, the things that the, this omnibus bill dealt with is last year, because of the, you know, the pandemic, we, we yes. had to pass some special legislation because condos couldn't have their annual meetings. There is, legis there is uh, uh, you know, statutory uh, language that says boards can have remote meetings. And that was because of the Hurricane Aniki in Kauai when, you know, right. boards couldn't meet. And so we changed the law to say that so long as the board members could hear each other simultaneously, right, the board could have a meeting. So, Back then, the technology was a telephone conference, right? But that applies to board meetings. So during the pandemic, we were allowed to have board meetings remotely, but we couldn't do an annual meeting. And so we 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 got uh, the year before we had some uh, legislation that said we could do annual meetings remotely, and then people liked that. But it, but then the way the law, law was written, it said only in the case of an emergency, right, where the governor issues these emergency orders. Could the annual meeting be held remotely? So what we did in 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 the omnibus bill is we asked Aaron and and he helped us and we got the 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 language in there. But now you can have the annual meetings have done remotely if the owners vote for it at an annual meeting and they can give the board the discretion. Right. And once that's done, we don't have to have an emergency. Uh, you know, if if we if the board wants to do an annual meeting. That's really important because I think um, a lot of the time when I receive um, calls from condo residents, a lot of the time they're focused on governance type issues, these kinds of management issues, board related decisions, board management. So I think we have to, you know, we should, I think this is great to give them flexibility to do something like this. Um, it's, you know, one less set of callers that I have to refer to Jane Sugimura. <laughs> going forward okay well you know we're getting close to the end can you i know you were involved with the chun brothers and you know the chun yes. brothers caused so much misery to to people in kakaako and apartment owners and small businesses for years so can you give us an update on um and you were so uh you know so effective in in in, in curing that problem absolutely so uh, I haven't always represented Kakako. I began to represent Kakako in 20, the year 2012. Um, 
And, you know, about a year after I um, started to represent this area, I received some complaints from residents about this company that was, had taken over roads and was charging the public to use to park there. Um, and that was the Chun Brothers, this Kakako Land Company. So, you know, was, so I kind of started to look, at, look into this. And what I learned was that how it started was the Chun Brothers in 1985 were, had been doing research on, you know, on roads and they stumbled across these Kakako roads and found out that um, the, that the original owner of the roads who had, who had, who had left Hawaii like in the year 1901 um, had a granddaughter who was still in Hawaii. So they found the granddaughter who was an elderly woman, an elderly woman who was living alone in a basement in Manoa. And they went to her house a few times to, and finally convinced her to sign a quick claim deed for these roads. And that's how the roads were transferred to the Chun brothers is through this quick, quick claim deed, which as you know, doesn't offer any assurance that the person who signed the quick claim deed actually owned the roads, right? So this whole thing was based on a quick claim deed that they secured from an elderly woman, probably under duress, right? Uh, in her Manoa basement. Uh, so fought, you know, uh, going forward, um, the Chun brothers, uh, uh, started to charge for the use of these of these roads. They would tow cars that were not paying the fees. Um, a group of business owners uh, fought a lawsuit, and I was able to work with the attorney general to to join that lawsuit. So a year ago, the uh, court finally ruled in the case, and the court's decision was that these roads belong to the public. They are not private roads. Um, that case, that decision is still on appeal, but I, I'm pretty sure that the, 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 uh, that the appeal is gonna fail and that, and that the Chun brothers are gonna lose on the appeal. A few months ago, the attorney general filed a second lawsuit. And this is a lawsuit on behalf of all of the consumers who have paid over the years, have paid for parking or who have been told or have been damaged in some other way by the Chun brothers actions. And so this lawsuit is basically a class action lawsuit. The Attorney General just filed it. So they're working, working it up. Uh, I'm hoping that they'll be successful. I'm also hoping that the Chun brothers have not scrolled away all the hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars that they basically stole from people uh, over the past 10 years. Well, thank you very much for that update. And thank you for your efforts in in you know bringing justice you know to the people in Kakaako you know from the Chan brothers but we have run out of time and I'm so oh. grateful that you were on my show today and so thank you for uh being here and I want to thank the viewers uh for joining us and you know please uh, tune in next week for another episode of Condo Insider it's the show for people who live and work in condominiums mahalo and aloha Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.